Move on again, Malloy. The land is made to roam. There's no man can destroy the road you take for home. Move on again, Malloy. The land is made to roam. There's no man can destroy the road you take for home. Today you're going to be watching a how we can stop, this is Work With Nature vlog by the way, how we can stop diseases spreading from seeds that you've saved onto the next generation. Let me just take a seat. Oh. Right, so we also have on Patreon somebody asking a question that I'm going to answer today in this video. Um, his question actually gave me the idea of this video in the first place, so big, big thanks to you. I'll read that out in a short while. We'll also get on to uh, different ideas on how to actually combat uh, diseases that are actually on our seeds or in our seeds as well. And yeah, but first I have to go and do a bit of work. I wanted to mention just one, no, two things uh, about the actual fungal disease here on the amaranth and also, of course, the weeds that are growing here as well. Whew. So it's going to be hard for me to communicate because it's really, really hot and so excuse me if I'm going to go a bit slow now. Okay, so first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to mark all the amaranths that doesn't have fungal disease and if I have 10 then that's okay. But if I don't have 10 plants then I'm also going to mark some that have very little. And the rest then I'm going to put, pick up all the, the leaves that are diseased and we're also going to treat those seeds. So all the seeds will be fine. Um, the only snag here was that we grew them during the monsoon time, which is, it's obviously going, like fungal diseases are the most, uh, there are more fungal diseases than there's bacterial diseases and viral diseases. So obviously we're going to get a lot of fungal diseases during uh, the environment that actually makes them grow happily. And yeah, they do spread around a bit as well. So we want to take the leaves away and just make sure that, like basically just go through all your plants and pick up all the leaves, wash your hands afterwards, wash your clothes afterwards with some detergent, or just don't, try not to touch the leaves if possible. Uh, just be wary of that. Now, I'm just gonna quickly talk a little bit about weeds and then we'll get on to actually in the afternoon making the video. I need to sort this stuff out. Most weeds are just, bad weeds because they're in the wrong place at the wrong time. Perennial weeds I tend to pull out because they will just spread but the soft annual weeds usually I leave. Now if I see any weeds that have any kind of disease then obviously I'm going to pull those out as well because they're just going to spread um, diseases onto our plants as well. So see this weed here it's not looking happy so take it out as well and leave all the happy weeds uh, behind that's a really good idea. And what else is there to say? Oh yeah, weeds basically are medicinal. Most of the weeds are really, really helpful to humanity and we should just keep them. We should really respect them as well. They're actually a great herbal remedy, especially like, I used to train as a herbalist and I've seen wonders done with herbs. So, and herbs are the weeds. We basically, as a herbalist, you just go into nature and you pick any kind of weed that has specific actions and you use that. So weeds are really good. Also they are living mulch and they also prevent the soil from sweating which means that your plants are going to be really really happy providing their annual weeds. So keep your annual weeds where possible and learn the difference. Okay, that's it. I'm going to carry on and I'll see you in a minute. Okay, some have been asking where do we live? So I can't show you everything, but I'll show you a bit. That's just the toilet and nobody wants to see the toilet, but this is basically our little kitchen. That's what we got. Very nice. This is where we sleep. Now exclude the mess, please. Especially my corner, because my corner is really messy. 
I haven't had the time to do my washing, I really gotta do that. This is my computer where I do the editing, that's the fan that stops the computer from exploding. And that's pretty much it, that's where we sleep. Nice mosquito net as well to stop us from getting bitten by mosquitoes. And that's it! Okay, up to the farm! And that is the center. There you go. This is what I eat, man. Well, it's okay. It takes some getting used to. Right, cross over this bridge. And that's where the bikes are stored, just at the back. Now there's loads of bikes and basically there's several farms and we can use them. And usually I pick one of these bikes and it's usually this one here. This lady's bike. The only reason being, I put my water bottle on the back. Okay, so that job is done. Pretty much. Also, another thing I want to mention is uh, there's always one leak, you know, Just staring you in the eye. Put that in my bag. One thing I wanted to mention as well is that if you have any kind of um, leaf litter around your plants, so let's say you didn't get to the job and some of the leaves would have fallen onto the ground, you just make sure that you take those leaves away as well. Otherwise, uh, some funguses and bacteria can actually be uh, alive in the soil. Another good method actually of killing them is compost tea. So just by masses of healthy organisms in the compost tea, they're gonna gobble up all those pathogens in the soil as well. Mustard is another one. Actually, if you're growing a mustard, green manure mustard, you can dig that in after a few weeks of it growing. If it's about that high, you can just dig it in and that'll kill your uh, pathogens as well. Now that's not great for the soil food web, but at the same time, it's sometimes the only solution. Now, look at that. That is a weed that probably very likely has a virus. And viruses are the one thing we cannot do anything with except pull up the entire plant, get rid of it. I, I want to mention that because it's really important. Now that's the bag. I'm going to, normally I would actually burn it in the biochar pit because that will kill all everything pretty much. Um, no, it'll just kill everything. And uh, today what I'm going to do is, because I haven't got time to make biochar, I'm going to go as far as possible over there where there's nobody, just cows, and I'm going to drop that over there and then that's finished and it won't be a problem. Right, so we'll get on to the question. Peter Healy asks, Hi, I would like to ask a question for your vlog. My garden is growing very well, uh, but I have a problem with blight on my tomatoes. It is a very nice old variety. Do I have to buy new seeds or can I use the tomato seeds from the ones that have the blight. If in doubt, buy the seeds. If you trust the company, then just buy the seeds. But if you want to save your own seeds and you can't get those seeds anymore, then what I would suggest you do is, first of all, not worry at all, because most, most uh, fungal diseases and blights, you know, you have late and early blight, they are also, of course, a fungus, and they can um, very rarely, I mean now very rarely, to be transferred onto the seeds, especially when they get into the fruit itself. But just bearing in mind, you're going to probably have more problems with the diseases that are present either in the soil or in the air. For instance, the, the fungal spores, um, you can have insects biting into the plants and then transferring bacterial diseases and viruses that way. And Peter, I would say to you, don't worry because fungal diseases are the one type of uh, disease that does not really affect the seeds that much. Bacteria and virus are way more tough, they can get into the actual embryo of the seed, whereas most fungal diseases at best, or rather at worst, will be on the actual seed coating. And when the seed actually germinates, often the seed coating gets pushed out of the way and then the, the, the microbes in the soil gobble those up. 
so they usually don't actually carry on to the next generation. But blight cannot travel up the leaf vein up to the embryo. Now bacteria, bacterial diseases and viral diseases can do that. That's why they're actually more of a problem uh, for your garden and you, you'll notice them much more than actual fungal disease, even though there's many, many more fungal diseases. Now timing is everything about fung funguses only come when the weather is um, and the environment is just right and then you have a big problem of course um, and I mentioned already treating them with sprays even organic ones uh, could be a solution there as well so don't worry uh, Peter don't worry about that at all it's going to be fine just make sure you select tomatoes that are actually good um, and look good and don't have the symptoms of blight as well that's what I'm trying to say Okay, so let's get on to actually how to clean our seeds, how to treat our seeds, and we'll have a look at that now. Okay, I thought I'd come up with a very, very, very simple way of explaining three different ways of actually treating your seeds. And the reason being is because I really need to get back to the garden, and this is just a quick way of showing you and explaining it really well to you as well. Okay, I need to mention first that, of course, with your fungal bacterial and viral diseases and um, there's nothing better than actually using heat to treat your seeds um, chemicals for instance there are some chemicals you can treat the the coating of the seed and that will kill most uh, bacterial and fungal diseases but heat also does that for you but heat also gets into the embryo of the seed without killing the seed and that is uh, what they have found to be the best approach like seed companies are actually using heat to treat their seeds in, to, to ensure that that doesn't um, happen that it doesn't get carried on to the next generation and viral diseases there's nothing you can do I just want to mention that real quick again pull out the plants get rid of them and otherwise you're going to have always a problem there are a few viral diseases that are also affected by heat but most of them are not so just to mention that okay so I'm just going to show you now the three methods the first method is actually it works if you are in the right environment at the right time so what I usually do and I've done this now a few times so I know it works really well what I do is I get a metal plate you can also get a, a big metal tray to do larger amounts and it has to be 30 degrees in the Sun outside and not raining obviously um, and what you then do is you put it into the direct sunlight and because of the the tray being metal it goes up to 49.5 degrees Celsius all the way up to there which is optimum temperatures for actually treating your seeds with dry heat you can stick them in the oven if you can regulate the temperature as well so you do that for 20 to 25 minutes depending on the size of the seed so if the seed is very very small you do it for um, 20 minutes at about 45 degrees Celsius if the seed is very big you do it for 25 minutes at nearly 50 degrees Celsius don't go above that because it might kill the seeds so basically you just stick it in there and just monitor it see if it's up to about 45 degrees or more and below 50 and then you just leave it for 20 to 25 minutes and then your seeds are clean you can stick them in an envelope somewhere and store them for next year's crop so that's method number one method number two you get yourself a sieve with the seeds inside there and you would have a pot that would fit it nicely so you could sink it down a little bit now when you fill up the water to about here and above your seed level these seeds will be immersed in hot water and you will just bring the the water up to the about 50 degrees mark so again the same temperature range and then you would do that for again 20 to 25 minutes now if you stuck the seeds here in the bottom of the actual pot what will happen is because of the heat it could be a flame if you're using a gas stove or the heat from a, I don't know what you call the things electrical sto uh, cooker then basically the seeds might um, get way too hot and die on you so this is actually a good way to get them submerged in water and get the right heat I'm um, sorry for showing such crude implements but it's more that you get how it works than actually what it looks like so 
third method, and this is the best method um, I find. And we used to do when I used to work for the seed saving company. They basically had a large, large machine, and they would steam their seeds. Steaming is is way better than these two methods because it's just more time efficient. And for that, what you have to do is you have to steam your seeds at 68 degrees for 90 seconds. So one and a half minutes at 68 degrees Celsius and you can actually clean your seeds very quickly. So what I would typically do, let me just show you the setup with these crude implements. I would have a, 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 a pot or some kind of vessel that is making actually the steam. Then I'd have a chamber, a steaming chamber. I'd somehow connect a pipe to it and then what I would do is I would have a tray of seeds. I would put the tray of seeds in there. I would drill a hole in here somewhere to put the accommodate the thermostat, maybe below the sieve. And basically, as the steam is entering the lower part of the chamber, um, I could also drill a few holes as well to let out some of the steam if it's too hot. And then what I would do is put a lid on that. And when the steam goes in there, I'd leave it in there at 68 degrees exactly. It can be anything between 65 degrees and six, uh, 68 degrees. So the temperature has to be exact. And then 90 seconds, seconds are over. I take my tray out and I put another tray in. Just keep repeating that. And it's just a really quick, fast way to do it. And I want to build something like this in the future as well, because it would save us a lot of time, a lot of hassle and we are guaranteed to have great uh, seeds then after that. Now then I would just take this, put it somewhere to dry. When they're dry, stick them in an envelope and that's it. Put them in the fridge or freezer and then they are stored for uh, the next planting season. I hope that was uh, not too lengthy and I hope you understood how this works. If you have any questions, ask in the comment section down below. Yeah, and otherwise, again, Thank you for watching and yeah, I might see you in the next one as well. Whew. That was a lot of talking. <laughs> By the way, thanks to all my friends on Patreon. You guys are great help. Right. Oh, I got a dead leg now.